Hey guys, welcome to Skilllink. If you're someone who's been following the automobile industry closely, you would have noticed a new trend. Consumer cars have started becoming more and more fuel efficient over the years as opposed to becoming more powerful. But there is a small problem. You see, IC engines have reached a certain level in development. Any more attempts to make them more fuel efficient will cost massive amounts of time and money. So what is the difficulty in making them efficient? To understand about IC engine efficiencies, let's first look into how exactly an IC engine works. A certain mixture of fuel and air is pumped into the engine cylinder and ignited. Due to this, pressure builds up in the system and is then used to push the piston inside the cylinder up and down. When the ratio of fuel in that mixture is more than air, it is called as a rich ratio. And if the ratio of air is more than the fuel, then it's called a lean ratio. You see, many early engines were designed to run on lean ratio when the vehicle is cruising. That is, usually 15% excess air is added to the air-fuel ratio. So what's the problem with this? We could run the vehicle on lean mixture and use much lesser fuel. Sounds simple, right? We have a problem here too. The main inhibitor for this is a three-way catalytic converter used on engine exhausts. It works properly only if the engine air-fuel ratio is at a stoichiometric ratio. To better understand the statement, let's take a look at the equations that characterize the chemical reactions that take place in a catalytic converter. Three major processes take place. Reduction of nitrogen oxides to nitrogen, oxidation of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, and oxidation of unburned hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide and water. Any change in the chemical composition of the exhaust gases can lead to a disturbance in this. For gasoline, the stoichiometric ratio is around 14.6 is to 1. This means, for every 14.6 parts of air, one part of fuel is used. Only at this ratio can the catalyst both oxidize the carbon monoxide and the unburnt hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide, water vapor, and also be able to chemically reduce the NOx into nitrogen. Along with this issue, gasoline has very little lean flammability. That means if the gasoline air mixture is too lean, the flame will not propagate across the cylinder in a very short time or the flame will not even start. This could lead to cylinder misfires. This again puts a huge burden on the catalyst as it has to oxidize a massive amount of unburned hydrocarbons. This will drastically reduce the life of the catalyst and require replacement. The second option that we have is to run the vehicle at very high compression ratios. But higher compression ratios can lead to auto-ignition, which is commonly known as knock. Knocking generally occurs when the compression ratio is about 10.5. This can be prevented if the fuel has a high octane number. You might think that this is an advantage, right? But this is not true. You see, high octane fuel is not readily available to everyone everywhere. This means commercial vehicles cannot really be designed with high compression ratios in mind. On top of it, any increase in fuel saving by using high octane fuel is offset by the increased price of the fuel itself. Along with this, it is not recommended that ordinary fuels be used in an engine designed for high-octane fuel. It could lead to heavy knocking. So how else can we increase fuel efficiency? This can be done by fine-tuning the engine, which means reducing the internal friction of the engine, choosing the most efficient drivetrain, and driving the vehicle at a modest RPM. By even doing this, we have reached a threshold for development. However, as we just told you at the beginning of the video, modern cars are getting more efficient. But how is this possible? Well, this is because of the use of hybrid powertrains. Let me take a case in Formula 1. In 2006, FIA introduced new regulations to the sports. The engines had to be 90 degree V8 engines. During this period, the engines reached a peak thermal efficiency of 29%. In 2014, FIA again changed the regulations for the engines. The engines were expected to be V6 turbo hybrids. The thermal efficiency figure almost immediately jumped to around 40%. Right now, at the time of recording, that figure stands at 50%. From 2014 to 2020, the engines became almost 20% more efficient. The main reason behind this jump is the introduction of an energy recovery system and integration of a hybrid drive into the engines. The advancement of simulation and CAE technologies over the years has also contributed towards this. <coughs> Marketing content. <coughs> Since we're talking about simulation and CAE, we would like to introduce you to two of our courses, 
hybrid electric vehicle simulations using GT Power and IC engine calibration using GT Power and GT Suite. In these two courses, we have prepared a comprehensive tutorial towards IC engine and hybrid electric drives that are used in hybrid vehicles. Do check it out. The links are in the description. So let's head back to our video. Although this improvement in efficiency is to be expected as the engine size was reduced from 2.4 litres to 1.8 litres, the upper rev limit of the vehicles were also reduced to 15,000 rpm from 18,000. Even with these reductions, a jump from 28% to 50% thermal efficiency is unprecedented. So let's now focus on the main reason behind this, the hybrid electric drive. Hybrid electric vehicles are classified into two types, based on their powertrain and based on the degree of hybridization. We've already made a dedicated video on the classification based on powertrains. We'll add a link to it in the description. Do check it out. So, let's move on to the classification based on the degree of hybridization. Here, the vehicles are further classified into three types. The full hybrids, the mild hybrids, and the micro hybrids. Full hybrids have a good amount of flexibility in their mode of propulsion. Full hybrid vehicles can be driven by both the electric motor and the IC engine together. Apart from this, the motor and the engine can also drive the vehicle individually. As discussed, these vehicles offer a good amount of flexibility, but the downside is the increased complexity and overall cost of the vehicle. These vehicles have a big battery pack to power the electric motor during the battery-only operation. A good example for a full hybrid is the Toyota Prius. The next classification is the mild hybrid vehicle. These vehicles have only a few of the features which are available in full hybrid vehicles. The size of the starter motors of these vehicles is increased and is mounted between the engine and the transmission. So effectively, the motor replaces the torque converter and is used to supply additional power to the vehicle during acceleration. The motor also allows the vehicle's engine to be turned off whenever it is coasting on a highway and also acts as a regenerative braking system. The last classification is called the micro-hybrid. Micro-hybrid is the most basic type of HEV. It has the functionality of the start-stop system. In this, regenerative brakes are integrated into the vehicle. When the vehicle brakes, the regenerative system converts the kinetic energy of the vehicle into electrical energy and is used to charge the car's battery. Well, that's it for this video, guys. We'll meet again in the next one. Until then, stay safe and bye.